Uh, you can start making your way back to your seats right now. Uh, where's, uh, where's Kyle Levesque at? <laughs> He's, uh, he's hiding in the, the depths of um, the uh, backstage. Uh, I just like that um, for uh, football Sunday or tailgate Sunday, uh, you went caps, which is totally okay. The best N blank L is the NHL. Ooh. Well, you can, well, you, can, you can go back to Canada. It's okay. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, man. Uh, and uh, I just want to say to um, the uh, sing well, actually, there's two Bronco fans right here. I see one in the back, one over here. Is that right? Broncos right there. Waterboy? Yeah. Bobby Boucher? Up in this place? Come on! If you want to know what kind of church you're at, you're in a one who's got a Bobby Boucher jersey in the back. Let's go! Oh, that is fantastic. Well, I was going to make fun of you, but I'll just make fun of Mike Sigmund instead because he actually is a Broncos fan. Uh, what was the score to the uh, Commanders Broncos game? You don't know? It wasn't like a Hail Mary or anything that made that... Um, Okay, anybody watch that game? Anybody? Okay, so uh, confession for a moment. I didn't watch that game. I just learned about that about 45 seconds ago. Um, not a huge NFL fan. Got a couple reasons for that. Um, but I will tell you about uh, this jersey right here. Uh, if you have ever been a Washington Redskins, yes, I said Redskins fan, um, you know that this name on the back is not a good name. That's not a good name right there. So... Sweet. So I, uh, I got um two of these jerseys for like fifteen or twenty dollars a couple of years ago. So on the and like the discount section of the discount section, and so I'll wear it and I like it. Um, but I, I love seeing uh some of these jerseys out here today. And uh, you know what it means right now that uh we are in the second day of fall, y'all. Uh, which uh, means a couple of things. It means leaves are falling. Um, especially if there's a tropical storm out there, which uh, let me just hold this for a second. Um, Butch Stoneman, who is over here on the right-hand side, is one of the wildest gentlemen I've ever met. He took a group of guys fishing in the tropical storm on Friday. Um, Buck is cheering because he's finally stopped throwing up from all of the waves that happened. Uh, absolutely wild, but... Um, Tropical storms, that kind of happens in fall. It also means that uh, football is back in season, uh, which I'm a, uh, a big fan of, uh, of college football especially. And it also means that if you go to Lowe's right now, you can see all of the inflatable Christmas decorations because that's how we do this in uh, the month of September. Um, we got some people cheering for Christmas right here. Kid you not, I saw an oversized Halloween spider fighting Santa Claus at Lowe's this weekend. Um, all I gotta say is welcome to White Oak. That's what happens when you go there. Uh, but, you know, speaking of Christmas, uh, anybody got the Christmas countdown going on right now? 92 days. 92 days until, we got a bunch of Christmas haters in this place. You don't have like the, uh, the countdown that goes all year round. Um, I, I'm a big Christmas fan. And uh, one of the things I love about Christmas, uh, and you can never start too early, is the whole gift exchanging process. Isn't there something absolutely awesome about watching somebody else open up a gift? Like I, I love, we got kids cheering right now. Like if, you're, if, if your kids are sitting right here, there are high expectations for Christmas this year. Um, but like, I love the process of, of watching somebody's face, especially kids light up when Christmas gifts are exchanged. It's, a, it's such a, uh, a really cool thing. And what I've noticed in uh, Christmas traditions is you uh, go about the Christmas exchange one of two ways. Um, one way is what I would call the attack method. It's when you all gather around the Christmas tree and like somebody like starts a, like a, like a blow horn or something like that and everybody attacks the Christmas tree at once and everybody unwraps their presents all at once. Anybody like that here? We got one person in the back right now. Okay, watch out for her. I'm just gonna say that. Or you, you point somebody else out. Oh, there she is right there. Look at your mom calling you out corner to corner in the auditorium. Okay, so for the rest of us, other than two of the people that aren't saved, um, we understand there is a process of like going present by present and, and watching people be able to open them and to be able to experience them. And uh, there are gifts in life that you are going to open. There are also gifts in life that you are going to experience. And uh, this morning, I wanna talk to you about some of the gifts that are present in our life. We're in this series called The Uphill Upgrade, and we're looking at the, the life of Joseph and some of the, the peaks and valleys that he went through, because that's life, right? We have peaks and valleys, and we are going to see that there's some incredible giftings that are found in his life. 
So let's go ahead and uh, just pray real quick that uh, God would allow me to be able to teach this text accurately and it'll be beneficial to everybody that's in this room. So uh, join me in praying. Uh, Pray for me this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. Um, God, I ask as we uh, open it up and we evaluate it, um, that you would allow us to be able to um, not only understand, um, but be able to apply the word. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So one of the first gifts that this guy Joseph has, um, and if you don't know much about his life, that's okay. You're going to be able to understand some of it throughout the morning. And if you don't have a Bible, we have some that are out in the lobby. We'd love to give one to you just as a gift. Um, but, But if we look in Genesis chapter 37, it's the first book of the Bible. In the fifth verse, it says this, now Joseph had a dream. And I'm telling you, there's the gift of of having a dream. There's a gift of dreaming that is out there. And, and, and what, I, what I think is so cool is that Joseph had this dream and this dream is gonna end up being a big deal, not only to Joseph's life, but in fact, to all of Egypt and to his family's life as well. And so I figure if we're gonna talk about Joseph's dream, let's just go ahead and read through what his dream was because it's pretty wild and it caused some family drama. So chapter 37, verse six, it says this. He said to them, this is Joseph talking to his brothers, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And if you don't know what that is, that's basically like a bundle of grain or a bundle of wheat. And so we had this dream that there was several different bundles of grain and that one of them, his arose and stood upright in the seventh verse. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. And so you have his standing up and the other ones that are all bowing down to it. And his brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dream and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and he told it to his brothers and said, behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And if you were with us last week, how many brothers did Joseph have? 11. So so if we look right here, we see that these 11 stars would have represented the 11 brothers that he had. 11 plus one is? Okay, so now these are the original 12 tribes of Israel that are wrapped up in this family, a foreshadowing of the 12 disciples that are present. But these 11 were bowing down. These 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told this to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. What I, what I love about Joseph is that Joseph dared to dream dreams. And that sounds insignificant But I think in the context of people that were existing then and also in the context of people existing now, the courage to dream dreams is actually a pretty big step to make. Like in verse five through six, it says, now Joseph had a dream and when he told his brothers, they hated him even more. And they said to him here, he said to him, hear this dream I have dreamed. You see, God had put a divine dream inside of Joseph. And what I know about God putting a dream in Joseph is this isn't just about Joseph. Y'all know this, right? Like this is not just about him. This is actually a a message to all people that would be considered believers because this is the foreshadowing of the 12 tribes of Israel, which would have been the foreshadowing of the tabernacle, which would have been the foreshadowing of the early church. And so we look at this kind of trail that takes place. And so the idea that Joseph dreamed dreams is a foreshadowing that we ourselves can dream dreams. And the question actually is not about the calling in your life. The question is about the courage you have in your life. Do you have the courage to take a step out and do what God has told you to do. Because what I know, and I think that you inherently know as well, is that God has put dreams and passions inside each and every single one of us. And they could be big ones. They could be seemingly small ones that would end up being quite magnificent. But, But dreams and visions and ideas exist for every single one of us. And I know there's probably some of you right now that are going, well, God actually hasn't spoken to me in any way. And and what I would tell you is that it may not be that God's not speaking to you. It actually might be that you're not listening for his voice. And, And it's not necessarily an audible voice that comes out. I have personally never heard the audible voice of God. If you have, hey, kudos to you, great stuff. But for, for most of us, 
It is this still small voice inside of us, this, this yearning to pursue things that are of great significance in God's leading. And Joseph not only had the capacity to dream dreams, which is, is a big deal, because when, he didn't just dream it, he did what? He called it out, right? Like it's one thing to have a dream inside of you that you kind of keep silent and you keep to yourself. It's something else to step forward and to proclaim that God has put something on your heart and your life and to take action steps towards it. See, the dreaming of the dream isn't necessarily the hardest part of it. It's actually having the courage to walk that dream out. Now, what is interesting about Joseph is what happens after he calls this out. Like I'm trying to put myself in this little like whole family bubble right now. And I imagine one of the youngest brothers rolls up and is like, hey, brother, you and mom and dad and the other 10 that are in the family are all going to bow down and worship me. And the other brothers are probably like, what kind of crack pipe are you smoking, brother, right now? Like, this is, this is, this is a big deal. Like, what are you saying? And so, yes, he had the, the courage to be able to say that. But look what happens right after he does this. Three times in a row. How many times? Three, okay, look at this. Verse five, it says, now Joseph had a dream and when he had told it to his brothers, they loved him for it and said, you're the greatest brother ever. Thank you for ruling over us. No, they were ticked off. They hated Joseph because of it. They were so mad. And then in verse eight, his brothers say to him, are you indeed to reign over us or indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more. And then he has the second dream. And when he told his father in verse 10, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and brothers indeed come and bow ourselves to the ground before you? When he spoke his dream out, the first thing that took place was discouragement. And I would venture to say for many of you, as you've taken steps forward and as you've pursued things and as you've dreamed things, the moment that you call out something God has deposited in you is the moment that a roadblock is gonna show up. And, and, and I wish that when you called out something, it was just this beautiful pathway. But more often than not, when you call something out, there's work to be done behind that. It's not a called out and a downhill process to achieve significance it's usually calling out what God has deposited and it's actually an uphill grind to be able to reach where God has called you. And so discouragement is the thief of dreams. Don't let it rob you of your potential because there's always gonna be haters. There's always gonna be naysayers. And sometimes the very people that you thought were gonna be behind you when something happened are the very people to speak up first against you. Because Joseph had this dream right now and I wish that his brothers, his tightest group, and his mom and his dad, they would have all been formed. But those are the ones right there, those 13 people that were the first to speak against what was happening. And we're gonna see as Joseph's life continues on that this dream actually ends up coming to fruition. But, but I, I, I gotta say this one more time. There's some of you in here, I know there is. You have a yearning inside of you. There's a passion inside of you. There's a dream inside of you. And you have not had the courage to step out and walk it out or the moment you face discouragement, you began to backtrack on it. And what I know is that if God is for you, who can be against you? That if you have the power of God in your life, you have everything you need to be able to accomplish a God-sized dream. And what I love about a God-sized dream is that a God-sized dream can't happen on your own effort. Because if it could happen on your own effort, then who would get the credit? You would. I want to live my life. I want to see you live your life in such a way to where you dream so big. It can only happen if a move of God showed up. And that's what we see in Joseph's life, that he is willing to dream that big. But he didn't just have the gift of dreams. He also had the gift of gifts, which sounds a little bit like a strange wordplay, but you're going to see it flesh out in a moment. When it comes to different giftings, we need to realize that it's exactly that. It's different giftings, right? Can you imagine if you put a six foot five, 150 pound wide receiver on the defensive line? Okay, for some of you who understand football, you're going, that would be a bad idea. The rest of you is like, what's wrong with that? It sounds like a big guy. Let me help you out. You get a thin, fast person. You don't put them over with the big boys, all right? You don't put them with the guys that are weighing 450 pounds and benching uh, entire solar systems. Like you just don't do that because 
Some people have the gifting of strength. Some people have the gifting of speed. Some people have the gifting of teaching. Some people have the gifting of administration. Some people have the gifting of encouragement. Some people have the gifting of miracles. There are different giftings that are found, right? We looked at that in the book of 1 Corinthians throughout the summer, that that there are some gifts that are found over here that are not found over here, but all of us have different giftings and they are designed to complement one another. And so we're seeing that Joseph has the ability to interpret dreams. He didn't go to dream interpreting class. That's not a thing. It was a God-given gift that he had. And I've met people that have that gift. I personally don't but I've met people when I've had a dream, I've shared it with them and they have completely outlined what would happen over the next couple of months. It's absolutely fascinating. But Joseph had this ability. So in chapter 40, verse eight, they said to him, we have dreams and there is no one to interpret them. At this point, Joseph's sitting in jail and he's with some other people that have dreams. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. You see, the giftings you have are exactly that. They are giftings from God. And Joseph points to this in verse eight, that this ability to interpret dreams is not a skill that he has. Rather, it's a gifting that comes straight from God. And he gets this ability to be able to interpret dreams. But what I love is what happens when he interprets dreams. Because oftentimes we focus just so much on the gifting, but we don't look at the effects of the gifting. So Joseph's gifting ends up becoming an incredible blessing to others. If you know the backstory, there, there's two gentlemen in this story. Uh, there is a cupbearer and a baker, and they both have been put into jail, and they're having these dreams. And so Joseph now begins to interpret them. In verse 40, uh, chapter 40, verse 9, it says, So the chief cupbearer, who was in prison with him, told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, And on the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, the blossoms shot forth and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So that's the dream. Joseph now begins to interpret it. And Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. So the cupbearer had a job where he would basically give the cup to Pharaoh. Some things went down. He got fired from his job and got locked up into prison. He has a dream that we just talked about. Joseph interprets the dream and says, in three days, you're gonna end up back where you were. And sure enough, in verse 20, it says on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, happy birthday, Pharaoh, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And what's so awesome about this is that if Joseph would have refrained from exercising his giftings, the cupbearer quite possibly would not have walked into the dreams that God had for him. See, there's a cause and effect going on right here. There was a dream and somebody who interpreted it. And then there was the courage for the cupbearer to be able to walk that dream out. And what what I've noticed for, for many of us is that we begin to think that the giftings we have are just for ourselves. And can I tell you that the giftings you have are actually for other people. There are giftings that are found in this room right now that are positioned to help unlock the potential of other people. We were designed to be in community together. We talked about that last week and we're designed to serve one another. That's what we're talking about this week. And the giftings you have are not just for you. They are for the person to your left and for the person to your right and the person that's behind you and the person that's in front of you. Like what what, what I love is when somebody comes to me and says, hey, I have difficulty figuring out how finances work. I just, I struggle with money. Nobody ever taught me because in our school system, we're like periodic table of elements. That's important. Checkbook balancing. Nah, don't worry about that. Someday we'll get that straight. But we have people that they do, they just struggle with money. It's not because they're they're incompetent. They just struggle with knowing how, how it works. And what's so awesome is when there's somebody in the church who has a gifting of managing finances to be able to partner them up together and watch those skills be able to develop. What I love is when you see somebody who has the gifting of building or has the the gifting of being able to repair different things and you see somebody's car go down in the congregation and all of a sudden somebody else steps up and is able to serve that person. That is a beautiful thing when we can bear one another's burdens and use our giftings to help bless each other. 
That is what the book of Acts outlined. What do they do in the book of Acts? In Acts chapter two, it said they met house to house and in the temple courts and they shared everything they had and nobody lacked anything. And that was because they were sharing not only their physical items, but they were sharing the skill sets that they had as well. And so when it comes to utilizing your giftings, when it comes to dreaming things out, I I want you to wrap your mind around the reality that it's not just for you. There are people that are counting on the giftings that are found in this room. And now I want to ask the the worship team to come back up, but this is where it kind of goes full circle on this. Because the giftings that Joseph had were not just for Joseph. They were for the cupbearer and they were for Pharaoh. But look at how Joseph's giftings not only bless other people, but also bless himself. You see, Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. You see, while Joseph was living out his life in prison and he shared his giftings that helped benefit the cupbearer. It was actually a setup as well that would allow him to not only be a blessing to others, but to receive a blessing himself. And I believe the reason why this took place was because Joseph's intention was not just to bless himself, but his intention was to freely give the gifts that God gave him away. And then God's economy is absolutely amazing. You can never sow more than you will reap in God's economy. And so when the gifting came forth, he sowed the gifting, he sowed the gifting, he sowed the gifting. And then when the harvest came, it was more plentiful than what he had actually sowed. It's the, 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 the multiplying factor of the goodness of God. And so this dream that the cupbearer had led to a blessing in the cupbearer's life, led to a blessing in Pharaoh's life, but also led to a blessing in Joseph's life. And while Joseph was living out the blessing, he got to see others become blessed as well. And so I wanna ask this morning, if you would, um, if you'd stand to your feet for a moment. This is such a practical, message. You you ever have messages before where the preacher preaches and you get fired up and you're like, man, that's good. I'm so excited. I just cannot wait to do everything for Jesus. And then you get home and you're like, what do I do? Anybody like that? Or is that just me? Okay. It's only me. The rest of you all have perfect hermeneutical processing. I'm the one who struggles with it. Okay. So if you're like me and you struggle with it, let me help you out with this. The world would ask this question when using gifting. The world would ask, how does this bless me? Jesus would say, how does this bless others? Society would say, what is in this for me, AKA selfishness? Jesus promotes selflessness. The world would say, what do I gain from this? And Jesus would say, what does it prosper a man to gain everything yet lose his soul? See, when it comes to the giftings that are present, Jesus flips the gift. He completely flips it up. It becomes an uphill upgrade. And you now are a blessing to be a blessing. And when you're a blessing to be a blessing, you actually end up getting a blessing in return. It's like a triple blessing that takes place. It's a a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so what I would encourage you in is that you need to discover what your gifting is. It's in you. It's ready to be developed but you gotta press in and let the Lord help you develop that. Get some mentors around you. Find a place to be able to serve. If it's inside of the church, if it's outside of the church, it doesn't matter. Develop the gifting you have. There's a reason why you're here. And watch the blessings flow out of the gifting that you have been given. Because when you use that gifting, it's gonna shake some things up. That's what Jesus specializes in, amen? When it comes to working out your gifting and working out your salvation, I promise you, there is a blessing that only heaven can contain that will come down. And I wish there would be somebody in this place that would say, Jesus, I'm ready to be used however you want me to be used. 
I am simply a vessel here to be used by you. God, wherever you lead me, I will go. Whatever you show me, God, I'm going to walk that direction. I'm going to let your word be a lamp onto my feet. I'm going to walk this life out step by step going after you. And so if you bow your heads this morning, I just want to pray for you. God, I ask in the name of Jesus that anyone who could hear my voice right now would have a, an internal yearning to be used by you. God, that they would not be satisfied just reaping things, but Lord, they would be passionate about sowing into your kingdom. God, I thank you for the example of Joseph. And I pray, Lord, that we will be able to walk out our lives in a way that echoes the life that Joseph had. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.